years old but there's a great scene where he wakes up in the future mm -hmm. and the doctors are smoking and they say can you believe it they used to believe the fat and the cholesterol was bad for us <laughs> <laughs> so i keep hoping medical science will figure something out that we're gonna like. <laughs> so you just tell us that will you um i, I will try okay <laughs> i'll make it really simple simple that's the most difficult. Isn't it? Yeah. Well, I think I've mastered some of these. No. I... But gerontologic. You know, there you go. But I think I've got it. So. Or you could just say advanced nutrition certification. Oh, please. See, that's it's a nice. challenge. <laughs> now I'm keen to give it a whirl. Let's see what happens. We always try to overdo things as dietitians. I think it's part of our co I mean, just our personality. Well, I think the importance of a subject is based on the number of syllables in the title. So there are a lot of syllables. It is important. <laughs> yes. So. And we went from the American Dietetic Association to the Academy of, of Nutrition and Dietetics. <laughs> Make it as big as possible. Well, I'm going to... Let's see, we've got And it's Hannon? Hannon. Robert? Robert Hannon. Robert yeah. Hannon. I'm awful with names. No, me too. So, but I have yours right there. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Usually people will filter in pretty close to the end, but they do a pretty good job of uh, quiet and respectful. That's, it's the Alaska way. We're not prompt. No, here. we sure aren't. And do you, do you teach here? No, I don't. I, I used to work at KUAC oh. and a science reporter and news director. So that's why. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, I sure miss it. But I need to, I'm an administrator now, which isn't so cool. Were you on the radio? Yeah. Okay, so keep talking. 
Okay, uh, this is KUAC 89.9. I totally hear it. Okay. <laughs> I met Neil Conan and I was doing oh, the Charlie you? O'Toole show and they were coming in and I should have done that. I should have been like close by now. Yeah. Talk to uh, me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll feel your friends. Well, I think I'll start now. Did she say, how, how do you turn on the music? That is a good question. Was it I'm the internet thinking thing? we'll just do it like this. That won't mess up that. I don't think so. Okay. We'll find out. Well, you'll know what you're doing. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Robert Cannon, and on behalf of uh, the University of Alaska Fairbanks Summer Sessions, I welcome you to a complete makeover, Nutrition Matters. So I'm hoping I'll be completely made over by the end of the evening. <laughs> um, a couple of things, of course. We always tell folks, check your cell phones, because we don't want those going off during the presentation. And then I want to mention a couple of other things that are taking place this week and early next week that you might enjoy. For example, tomorrow night in this venue at the same time, Aftershocks, 50 Years of Earthquake Science in Alaska, presented by Michael West. Now, he's the state seismologist and a research associate professor at the Geophysical Institute. Then on Thursday, if you like music, you might want to go down to the Jorgensen Botanical Garden because the rock bottom stompers provide soulful, stompable tunes. And that's quite a combination, so I don't think you want to miss that. And then next Monday, this really looks fascinating to me, Parka Patterns, Dolls and Headdresses, the Mathematics in Yupik Measurement Techniques. So that's here at the, uh, the uh, Murray Building in this venue at 7 o'clock. Finally, if you like this presentation and the others that you might take in, you have an opportunity. There's some sheets out in the back in the foyer with, uh, where you can sign up and uh, give us your email address, and then we can uh, alert you to events that are coming up later this summer or even next year. So without further delay, let me introduce our speaker tonight for a complete makeover. Tiffany Ritchie is a clinical dietitian at the Fairbanks Memorial Hospital and Denali Center. She also is an adjunct professor at UAS Technical uh, Community and Technical College, teaching the science of nutrition to students since 2007. She served as the president of the Alaska Dietetic Association, promoting the profession of registered dietitian nutritionist to the Alaskan public. And she serves on the Bone Builder Backpack Program Committee at the Fairbanks Memorial Hospital and Denali Center. Tiffany maintains advanced nutrition certification as a certified specialist in gerontologic nutrition. As a healthy lifestyle companion, she's, certified, she's a certified health fitness specialist through the American College of Sports Medicine. She graduated from Kansas State University and completed her dietetic internship at the Medical University of South Carolina. Please welcome Tiffany Ritchie. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. That's quite a mouthful of all that. <laughs> um, well, thank you all for being here. I'm excited tonight to visit with you about my favorite subject, which is nutrition. I'm very passionate about it, and uh, it's my favorite thing to talk about. So you are a captive audience for me to spill my enthusiasm for the next hour. Um, if I don't talk loud enough or I talk too loudly, I'm new with the microphone, I feel like I should be making hand gestures and singing to you with this. I'm going to try and do my best to stay on target and not get away with my um, rock star hand moves. So just let me know if you can't hear me. So tonight we're going to talk about a complete makeover and why nutrition matters in that sort of manner. And I worked with uh, Daniel Craddock to put this together um, and we were talking about a, a subject to talk about and, and all the things that were wrong with our diet. And he said, you know, we just need a do-over, just a makeover. I thought, well, that's perfect. Let's make over our diet. That sounds wonderful. So uh, join me tonight as we walk through a nutrition makeover. Oops, it's this one. Oh, wait a minute. Was it the internet thing? Okay, see, that's good. <laughs> Oopsie. I like the music. Yes. Okay. 
Okay, and then just this. And then, this and this. Okay, thank you. You're Sorry. Welcome. Here we go. Right button. Okay. So tonight we're going to go over a basic makeover formula and an overview of our current diet um, and then run through a few reasons why we need to make over our diet. We'll go through the elements particular to a nutrition makeover and then just give you some simple general ideas just to get started. So by definition, a makeover is a complete transformation or remodeling of something. So if your house, like ours, is going an unexpected remodel right now, um, so we're completely transforming half of our house. Um, and the act or process of that is geared to improve the appearance, mightily so, and definitely the effectiveness, I'd like my bedroom back, um, of someone for this nutrition makeover, people or something. So a couple of examples of a nutrition makeover. Have you ever seen that show, What Not to Wear? Okay. So what they do is they take people, these poor people who used to have friends, I'm not sure they call them friends anymore, but they'll go around and video what they're wearing, maybe their personality and their hairdo or their makeup. They send it into this show. They ship them off to New York with all of their clothes, and, uh, and they get a makeover. And... Part of this process uh, before the outcome comes kind of a, a look at why that person needs to improve either their clothes or their um, appearance. Sometimes it's as simple as I just wasn't paying attention. I started doing my hair this way in 1970 and here it's 2013 and I, I haven't changed it at all so maybe I wasn't just paying attention. Or some people dress the way that they do uh, because they're trying to make a statement or maybe perhaps their mom um, always took a long time to get ready so now they never did. Sometimes these are deep-seated issues. Regardless, they work through this and then they come out, they learn some simple tools on how to become effective dressers, get up with the times, they redo their hair, and voila, you have these beautiful people who look nothing like what they did. They invite all of their friends back to this party to show them their new dues. I'm sure they throw out a couple of um, obscenities in the, in the meantime while they're mad at these people who videotape them. Another example of meal makeovers uh, or makeovers would be with meals. Taking basically what you're eating, looking at what's wrong with it or what can be improved, and then, and then having a different outcome. So, you know, taking a cheese steak that has refined white bread and lots of fatty cheese, not a lot of vegetables, but a lot of meat, and making it into a healthier dish. So what's wrong with it? It doesn't have enough fruits and vegetables. It's got a lot of simple carbs, too much saturated fat. Then we replace those nutrients with something else. And we have something the same but a little bit different but definitely healthier. So this is kind of the gist of a makeover. We're going to identify what's wrong uh, or look at where we currently are, identify what's wrong, and make suggestions for improvements. So going through a nutrition makeover, again, this would be the process of making changes not only to improve the appearance of the diet, but also the effectiveness. And I really want to hone in on uh, and follow the, the effect of our diet throughout this talk. We really can, our diet has a huge effect on our health. It can either promote good health or it can promote chronic disease. But it, we can have our diets be effective. So uh, what can we change in our current diet, in our current lifestyle habits to have an effective diet? So, and that will also change the appearance, by the way. So we're going to define the average American diet, identify some of the problems that, we're in, that are within the current American diet, make some changes, and then have some positive outcomes. You guys with me? Okay, not quite awake. It's kind of chilly in here. Maybe you're going into a little hypothermic state. Okay, so our current diet, and just to give you a disclaimer, there might be some slight exaggerations. Um, I might have some commentary and blunt observations. Those are only meant to enhance this presentation, most certainly not to offend. So please don't take offense at anything that I may throw up on this screen. Also, as a dietitian, I don't know if any of you know dietitians or are dietitians, we get a lot of... Um, People th seem to think that we have a perfect diet. And as I'd like to say that I have one, I most certainly do not. Um, I have a degree in nutrition. It's what I love to talk about, what I love to get paid to um, 
help people with, and I fully comprehend and most certainly believe the connection between good diet and health. But I'm not perfect. I'm only a dietitian. And I occasionally enjoy bread pudding. It's good stuff. Good beer. Thank you, Hoodoo, for coming to town. And chips and salsa. And I also buy my husband candy. So I'm just putting out there that even though I say these things, I do not have a perfect diet. So our current diet, and I'm sure you've heard this through the news, uh, kind of in a little bit of trouble. Um, our American diet and lifestyle lends to disease and disability to the tune that it contributes to about 310 to 580,000 deaths annually. And we'll talk about how, how they come about with this. But this is actually 13 times more than the deaths that are caused by guns and 20 times more than the deaths that are caused by drug use. So this is our diet and our inactivity. These are things that we choose to do or not do. And diet-related chronic disease represents the single largest cause of morbidity and mortality in the United States. Our diet and our inactivity contribute to the single largest cause of morbidity and mortality. That's crazy. I mean, how, that's what we eat daily is contributing to our deaths. That doesn't make any sense. So there are a couple of things that make our um, that that lend to this outcome. One of them is that our diet is imbalanced. So our diet is too high in saturated fat, sodium, and sugar, and it's too low in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and particular nutrients, calcium, and fiber. Now this promotes an imbalance of nutrients, and it promotes unfavorable conditions within our bodies, leading um, it it gives us the wrong uh, lean on the glycemic load. It also, um, we have the wrong fatty acid composition, meaning that we have too many saturated fatty acids and not enough unsaturated fatty acids. And then when it comes down to unsaturated fatty acids, we have too high of, a, of an intake of omega-6 and not enough omega-3. So that's part of the imbalance. Our macronutrient composition is off, so our macronutrients are the ones that provide calories, our carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. So we're, it should be a, a pyramid with uh, a little bit of protein, a little bit more fat, and a lot of carbohydrates, and ours is uh, out of um, cattywampus. It's not the way that it should be. We also have our micronutrient density is out of range. Micronutrients are our vitamins and minerals, so we have too much sodium and phosphorus in our diet, which it comes generally from packaged and processed foods, and not enough potassium, calcium, and magnesium. So that's throwing, that's also out of balance, which gives us an acid-base imbalance within the body, which leads to metabolic stress. Um, it also puts out our sodium-potassium ratio, nothing that we really need to get into. Um, this isn't a science class. This is a fun lecture. And our fiber content is a little bit too low. So we're not getting enough fiber to even meet our basic recommendations. So because of this imbalance, it increases the risk of chronic diseases. Heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, stroke, osteoporosis, and many cancers, all listed below. Interestingly enough, the leading cause of death in America, does anybody know? Heart disease. Nothing kills more Americans in this country than heart disease. That is due to the increased risk of heart disease comes from an imbalance of nutrients, which comes from our diet and physical inactivity. The second cause of death is cancers. The third cause of death is stroke. Diabetes comes in at number six, and high blood pressure, also known as hypertension, comes in at number 13. So we are dying of diseases that are caused by our diet, which is just crazy to me. I just, that doesn't make any sense. Not only is our diet leading to increased mortality, but it's also very disabling, meaning that it increases our uh, loss of independence and disability, which decreases quality of life. So diabetes, which is our number six killer in the United States, is the leading cause of blindness and amputation. 
in the United States. Very disabling there. And many men and women who have had a heart attack will be disabled from heart failure within six years. So that's being on disability and, and disabled. Again, these are a result of our imbalanced diet, so our eating habits and our inactivity. Man, we hate to exercise in the United States. Don't push that stuff on me. Um, and our diet is different. And when I was doing the research for this uh, presentation, I know I've been to Western Europe, and I know we eat differently, but it's difficult to pinpoint how different we are from those other countries. Well, we find that those who copy our habits here in America, the populations experience the increased rate of chronic disease that we have here in this country um, that they have never seen before, getting heart disease when that hasn't been a problem, dying of cancers that haven't been around, having high blood pressure when it's not an issue. When we look at other first world industrialized countries, so they have the same abilities to process food that we do, they have lower obesity rates lending to higher life expectancies. So countries such as Japan, South Korea, China, France, Italy, Spain, and Greece. And we look at what are they doing differently because those populations aren't all the same. Uh, and they are all industrialized and they are all first world. Well, they eat plant-based diets that tend to be lower in fat and they are higher in lean proteins, fish, uh, legumes, and fruits and vegetables. Um, they are also higher in antioxidants and omega-3 fatty acids, which would come from the foods that they eat. And they also enjoy their treats. They eat in moderation. So whether it be cured pork or high-fat cheese or sweets, they don't abstain from them. They just eat smaller portions. There's no pigging out like we do here in America and these other countries. Also, they ban chemicals and additives that we have in our foods. So um, this has kind of been in the news a little bit lately, and I don't know if you um, have heard there are food companies that make the same products here in America and they'll sell them to other countries. They'll reformulate the product so that it's acceptable in that country. In particular, starting off with artificial food coloring, that's banned in Norway, Finland, France, Austria, and the UK. And I put an example of the Kraft macaroni and cheese. Uh, there was um, a big petition sent to Kraft signed by hundreds of thousands of people um, by Food Babe. She's a blogger. She has some great recipes. Anyway, she petitioned Kraft to make the same type of macaroni and cheese that they sell overseas to sell here, and they wouldn't. What they don't uh, put in the macaroni and cheese over in Europe is artificial food coloring, but they put it in here. Uh, brominated vegetable oil, which is a flame retardant, it's found in uh, citrus drinks, so Mountain Dew, Gatorade, Powerade, Squirt. It helps to suspend the citrus in the drink. Uh, that is banned in all European Union countries. And so you can find that. I, I want to say that Mountain Dew said that they would get rid of it, but it's still in there. You'll see it as BVO or brominated vegetable oil. And then this has been a, um, a hot little additive lately, azodicarbonamide. Subway decided that they would get rid of it out of their bread. Uh, it's an additive that is found in yoga mats and sneakers, as well as frozen TV dinners and bread. That is banned in Australia, UK, and most European countries. You can find it in your bread at Fred Meyer's. It's in bold, and it's generally towards the end of the ingredient list. They don't allow that over there. We have it in a lot of our foods here. And this is just a snippet of the chemicals and additives that are not allowed in other countries, but we um, welcome them here. So our diet is different. Uh, we also have a different set of values that doesn't promote our health. So um, we, the values here in America, we have... We honor the pursuit of the individual as opposed to collective values. This leads to our Western capitalist wealthy society. And that's not unique to America. There are other Western European countries, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, that also have this capitalist, um, westernized 
uh, society and values. The problem is, is that we've allowed those to permeate all aspects of our life, including nutrition, whereas these other countries don't put those values in nutrition. So we prefer quantity over quality. We feel that we're getting gypped if we get a portion size of something when we're going out to eat. If you've ever been to a really fancy restaurant and people say, I can't believe I paid that much. There was hardly anything on the plate. Well, that's because it was a portion size. Um, instead of a ginormous, um, have you seen those platters like at Mexican restaurants? You know, they come out. It's a whole platter full of food for $9.99 or, well, in Alaska, it's probably $25.99. But um, we also have a high preference for variety. And when I was uh, growing up, there were three types of Oreos. Regular, double stuffed, that was a big deal when double stuffed came out, and then fudge dipped, so they had that. So I went to look for pictures of Oreos. I was overwhelmed by all the different types of Oreos. Uh, they're not something that I buy now. So they have inside out Oreos, they have peanut butter Oreos, reduced fat, um, they have um, banana split Oreos, they have one for every season, you know, um, for Easter and for Christmas and for Halloween. They've got birthday cake Oreo. They've got chocolate-covered birthday cake Oreo. So we have too much variety. So it's overwhelming in that as a consumer, we tend to buy more when there's more variety. I noticed, um, I shop at Fred's, so I just, I, I love Fred's. They, they have such a great bulk section. But I walked in the other day, and I saw that they had Peeps. You know what the Peeps are? Just peeps, just regular. And I thought, well, now, I saw last holiday season that they had Christmas peeps, and they had Halloween peeps. And peeps are those little marshmallow little bunnies that used to only come out over Easter. Well, now they're not a novelty. We have them, now they're just sitting on the shelf right now, and it's not even holiday time. Um, so we, we definitely uh, have a variety, and it's overwhelming. And compared to other Western countries, in America we prefer comfort over joy. And this I found kind of interesting. Um, there was a study in the Frontiers in Psychology uh, journal that compared the French attitudes about food and life to American attitudes about food and life. And what they found was that Americans prefer comfort, which they refer to things that make life easier, over joys, unique things that make life interesting. So in America, we like things that are convenient over interesting. And we lead busy lives, and so that makes sense. But the problem then, this, these three differences set up an environment that is not beneficial for our nutrition. So uh, they also asked the French, would you rather have an interesting life or a comfortable life? What do you think the French said? Interesting, yeah. It was better to have an interesting life over uh, a comfort life. So that makes our diet different than other countries who are similar minded to us. They just don't let it spill into their nutrition. And, and we can um, theorize maybe why they do this, because maybe they have a rich history. You know, we're all immigrated from all over the place. We're big melting pots, so we don't have a lot of tradition. Who knows? But bottom line is this is the way it is right now. So when we look at France, which is very similar to us as far as a first world Western mindset, where the other particular differences are with the way that we eat. So Americans snack, and we snack a lot. French frown upon snacking. And uh, not I, I guess this shows um, my age when I keep saying, well, when I was younger. <laughs> but when I was younger, snacks were those little tiny boxes of raisins. You know, 45 calories. It was a tiny little box, and your fat little hands could barely fit in there. You know, it's probably why it was only for kids, because adults could never stick their fingers in those tiny little boxes. And that's what you got as a snack. And now, a snack is, I, I saw a commercial, and I don't know who sells this, so I can't um, call them out, but they sell a tortilla with the fried chicken thing and some sauce in the middle. And that's a snack. That's like a 500-calorie 
snack. That's a meal. We've sort of lost our concept of snacking, and the French frown upon snacking. They eat meals, no snacking. Uh, French favor moderation. The Americans frown upon moderation. And when I was over in Europe, uh, nobody walked around with a coffee in their hand. And the only coffees that they sold were teeny tiny little coffees. So when you go to a coffee stand now and you order the smallest one, which we call a tall, it's because an eight ounce is a short. So they don't even sell, I shouldn't, I shouldn't lump them all. There are a few coffee stands who sell an eight ounce coffee. Most of them sell a 12 ounce and when you ask them for an eight ounce, they'll tell you they'll give it to you in a 12 ounce cup and they'll charge you for a 12 ounce but they just won't put as much in. And so we just have lost this concept of moderation. Uh, the French pay attention to what they're eating. We don't. We eat whenever. We eat when we're driving, when we're watching TV, when we're working. In fact, I'm not going to, I mean, if you work at the hospital, I won't, uh, won't call you out. But a lot of places, you shouldn't go take a lunch. It's kind of frowned upon to sit and relax during your lunch hour. Most of my colleagues, and um, they sit at their desk and eat lunch while they're working. And I, um, that's another thing I, I don't get. We, uh, we eat while we're grocery shopping. Have you seen people, they'll go to the deli, and I don't know how they know that they're paying for this, because I always, I always thought it was illegal to eat the food before you bought it, but they'll get you know, a chicken strip and walk around eating something while they're grocery shopping. Um, while we're walking, while we're shopping, and don't get me wrong, I am the girl that when my husband is out of town, I am on my phone and I'm flipping through Facebook or Twitter when I'm eating. <laughs> I'm guilty of that. Or I'm on Pinterest because it kind of gives me someone to, something to do while I'm eating, but we're not paying attention to what we're eating. So these lead up to uh, problems within our diet that where we need to make changes. So we're gonna go through uh, a few things on why we need to make change, um, what change can do for us, and then get to the changes. Another little disclaimer, uh, this is not easy. It's not easy to make change. If I, um, if I told you now that you needed to get up from the auditorium and walk backwards everywhere that you went, how quickly would you, how, I mean, when would you fall? Me, this, this hill, yep, I'd be, I'd be down. I wouldn't even make it out the door. But if you practice walking backwards, I bet in over a year, you would be pretty adept at it. In fact, my mom told me when she was younger that she walked backwards one whole summer. If I was her parent, I probably would have choked her because that would have drove me crazy. But it's not easy to make changes, especially with nutrition. It takes time. There is not just one approach. People go, uh, they'll either change their habits cold turkey or they'll wean themselves off of certain things. And you need support. If you um, wanted to quit smoking and your spouse or your best friend kept smoking, how difficult would it be to quit smoking? And I've told my, uh, my husband and I generally eat um, mostly the same, but he has his things in there. And if I'm having a weak moment, I say, you need to get your stuff and it needs to go out of the house. Whether you keep it in your pickup, I don't care, but it cannot be in the pantry because I am hungry and I will eat your trail mix or whatever else he has in there. Um, when I need support, then I, I let him know. Now, you don't have to change everything about yourself to change your nutrition. So some people think, well, if I change this, I'm not going to be who I am. And in particular, and I'm not trying to dog on the men, but oh, I'm meat, meat and potatoes. Well, guess what? You can still carry a concealed weapon and combat, fit in ch combat fish in Chitna and eat a plant-based diet. It's possible. It doesn't take away any sort of manhood by any means. Um, and in confession, I've been working on my eating habits since 2002, and I'm still incorporating changes. Um, one of the hardest changes I gave up, I have high cholesterol that runs in my family, and so I needed to give up saturated fat uh, or decrease it in my diet, and I had to give up half and half out of my coffee. So first of all, we had to start buying better coffee because I was going to taste it. And then second of all, I kind of had to wean myself off. And now I love black coffee, good black coffee.
but I, I knew that the benefits of changing my diet and improving my lipid profile outweighed the commitment of half and half in my coffee. So it does take time, and I'm still working on my habits. So when it comes to change, little changes add up. They really, really do. And if you've ever saved your change for a year, you know, in a jar or something, and you go to roll it, um, you find that you have 100, 150 bucks in your change jar after you start rolling up all your pennies and those tiny little dimes and those coveted quarters. You know, you over time, it didn't happen in one day. You didn't have $150 worth of change. But over time, it turned into lots of dollars. So the same thing with nutrition is tiny little changes add up. You can start with half and half in your coffee or giving up soda. Um, and over the course of a year, after lots of little changes, you'll have a radically different diet. Now, this might be, um, well, I'm just going to put this out there. Diets don't work. They just don't work. I haven't seen one work yet. It, and and I, this is my favorite excuse. Well, it was working, and then I started eating, and then it quit working. Well, then it never worked. If you gain the weight back, it never worked. That's not working. That's just a temporary new clothes size, and then you gain it back. And the reason, a lot of psychological, uh, psychological you're either on or off. Have you met those people that are either always on a diet, but then they got off their diet on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, but they started back up again on Monday? So you're either doing, you know, you're either doing well or you're doing poorly. Um, you've become a success or you've become a failure, and then you start to view food as good or bad, and that's a that's a tricky situation to be in, and there are. Uh, there are foods that are not as beneficial or that promote your goal as well as others. For example, bacon. Is bacon bad? It can't be bad. It's an inanimate, inanimate object. It just sits there. It smells good and it lends flavor, but it's not good or bad. If you want to lose weight and you're eating a pound of bacon a day, is that going to help you meet your goal? Probably not probably not going to help your heart disease either. If you are having a family reunion and you make this awesome potato salad that has some great bacon crumbles in there and you get the good bacon from the deli and you only use a couple slices and it lends to perfect flavor and everybody loves your potato salad, is bacon well, well worth it for that? Sure. Is it good or bad? No. Does that make sense? So this is what diets do is they, they make, they give food more power over the mind than what it needs to have. Food needs to be effective, but it doesn't need to be overpowering. And I uh, love this. They used to sell tapeworms. I think they still do, actually, for diets. So you swallow these tapeworms, which we would see in third world countries as a huge malnutrition issue, uh, but they do it so that the tapeworms eat the food and then they don't gain the weight. Well, clearly, if they're eating the food, then they're eating all the nutrients. But uh, people would buy this, and I love that it's Dr. Quack's tapeworms. I think that's to be made fun of. So understanding uh, the need for change, that diets don't work. I have this great study, and for those of you who are very science-minded, I love this. It's from 1948. Uh, Ansel Keys was one of the people on the study, and so it looks very different from articles that we get nowadays. Um, the terminology, it was, it was great to read an article because normally we dismiss um, science if it's, you know, five or ten years old unless it's a landmark study. Anyways, so they did a study in 1948, observations on human behavior in experimental semi-starvation and rehabilitation. That's a great title. What they did is they took 32 healthy men with superior psychobiological stamina, meaning these men were superior mentally and in physical, physically good health. So for 12 weeks, the men ate everything they pleased. They averaged about 3,500 calories per day. Uh, the food um, 
no, it's not the pyramid anymore. Uh, the food plate is based on 2,000 calories. So active men could probably take in 3,500. That's not an absorbent amount of calories for somebody that's active and using them. The next six months, the men were subjected to a semi-starvation period of about half their caloric intake, about 1,600 calories, to lose about 19 to 28% of their body weight. So today, this mimics what we would call a diet, hypocaloric, so low calorie deprivation, so less than what somebody needs. Now here are some of the outcomes from men in 1948. Their metabolic rates decreased by 40%. The men were obsessed with food. So they had heightened sense of cravings and they talked about food and recipe collecting incessantly. They, uh, their eating styles, depending on, on the men, uh, ranged from ravenous gulping, so taking down the entire meal you know, in two gulps, to stalling out the meal, eating their calories over two hours. The men deliberate, some of the men exercised deliberately to obtain increased food rations. Um, their personalities changed, and in many cases, there was onset of apathy, irritability, moodiness, and depression. Um, that's what my husband would describe me when I get hangry, like really hungry, and then I get angry. Um, so this was, this was men who were in superior psychobiological stamina after being on a diet for six months. So after the diet phase, they were allowed to eat food, um, and their hunger became insatiable. It's like the brain could not turn off what it was getting. The men found it difficult to stop eating, and in fact, weekend splurges range from 8,000 to 10,000 calories. So remember, before they started dieting, before they were deprived, these men were eating about 3,500 calories. They could eat anything they wanted. Um, and here's the sad part. It took the majority of men an average of five months to normalize their eating. So after that, you know, they had to relearn their behavior over five months. So uh, that's why diets don't work. They put us into this craze where we obsess about food and where we're irrational and irritable, and it takes a long time for us to gain our habits back. Um, that's with just a low-calorie diet. Ketogenic diets are ones that would be low-calorie and very high-protein. That's kind of been the craze for the last uh, decade, I would say. The reason that doesn't work is because when you don't give yourself enough calories or enough carbohydrates, your body's metabolism slows down. We don't give our bodies enough credit. They're very, very smart. You start starving them, they become efficient, super efficient, but not so efficient that you notice. They might drop the body temperature about 0.1 degree. Not so that you're cold, but just they're becoming efficient. They're not going to keep you as warm as what you were before. Uh, they'll slow down their digestive tract cell turnover rate, so your GI tract turns over most of its cells every three days. Well, they might slow that down three and a half days. Nothing that you would really notice until you became really constipated or maybe you had diarrhea, which you would assume might be part of the diet, which probably would be. But So we slow that down so that you burn less calories. So we slow your metabolic rate. Uh, you're not getting enough carbohydrates, which fuels your brain because you've kind of taken them out of the diet, so your body hates you for that. So does your brain, so you kind of become sort of in a fog. If you've seen people on a really high protein diet, they kind of just don't know what they're doing. Um, so you slow down your metabolism and then you say, I'm done with this. And then you start your normal diet. Well, the problem is, let's just say basic numbers, your metabolism rate used to be 1,000 calories a day to keep you alive and now it's 900. We go back to eating normally and you're at a lower metabolic rate, now you start gaining weight, more than what you used to before. So then you go on another diet. And this is that yo-yo effect where people start trying to diet, but then they end up gaining weight. It doesn't work. This is not the kind of makeover that we're looking for. Also, we have a fascination with nutrition. I mean, a little bit uh, more, maybe about the same that mine is. But 
Because nutrition is always changing, something's always coming out. Are we supposed to eat the egg, not eat the egg? Is saturated fat good for us? Is it not good for us? So we have a new study that comes out. It brings out a new theory. Then the shelves at Barnes & Noble fill with all the new books on this new theory. And then we have a lot of new infomercials based on selling diets around this. Wait a minute, then we have a new study and a new observation and a whole new slew of books. And so it's always changing. But that's not unique to science. Remember Pluto? Remember Pluto was a planet? And I had to look this up because I couldn't remember this. And you learned all the planets. My very educated mother just served us nine. So now they've got to come up with a whole new mnemonic or uh, acronym. That's what it is. Um, because that's not going to work anymore. So science is always changing. Nutrition is just happening sooner because it's a newer science. I mean, they used to think I was reading through the history of nutrition, and back in the day they used to think that the only way that muscles would work is if you ate protein and then the muscles exploded, releasing protein that helped you work. That was their theory. And then they got mad when it, when it tried to debunk. It's fascinating nutrition. Probably a bunch of dietitians in the making getting upset over nothing. Um, and also, being on a diet makes us unique. It makes us different from everybody else, and it sometimes allows us to put up appropriate boundaries, like, well, I can't eat that cake because I'm on a diet, you know, which is good. But then also, well, oh, I'm on a diet. I have this rigorous thing. Really? Ooh, tell me about it. And then you're popular, and everybody wants to know what you're doing. So that's kind of another aspect of it. Um, and I'm, I mean, I'm the first person to want to try something to be popular. I just want to be a cool kid. So I totally get that. I just don't do it with nutrition. And... Everybody eats. Everybody eats. Everybody hears stuff about nutrition. Everybody has an opinion. And there's mass confusion about what to eat. And pretty soon we just give all that up. We eat poorly. And then we feel we can go get a supplement and fix it. So I'll have a bad diet, but I'll take all these vitamins and it'll be okay. And if you go to Fred's, you see there's a whole wall of supplements. From the little tiny multivitamin to specific um, my, ma, micronutrients, so vitamins and minerals and even phytochemicals. And so pretty soon you're buying a bunch of different pills because they tell you that they're going to do something. But most of us don't have the basic physiology understanding that if we take too much of one thing, it can promote a toxicity. Or certain minerals bind with other minerals that pull that out, creating a deficiency. So supplements plus a poor diet do not equal healthy at all. And that makes it difficult to change when there's so much information and a lot of misinformation out there. Now, when it comes to making changes, before we get to the changes, we need to, we need to do um, the part in the what not to wear where they finally go through the clothes and they say, well, why are you dressing the way that you are? Why are you eating the way that you are? And this honest self-reflection is, is difficult. It's difficult to really look at our lives and say, what keeps me from being healthy? What keeps me from adopting a healthier diet? Um, and as you know, dietitians and nutrition professionals, when we, when we visit with people on this, this is where we run into that cemented behavior, the emotional eating, um, the association of, the negative association of healthy. I uh, talked with one lady and kept encouraging her to eat vegetables. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do that, I'll do that. And finally, when we started digging out the cookbooks, and she said, I hate vegetables. I mean, she's very adamant. My mom made me sit at the table every night all by myself because I wouldn't eat my vegetables. I won't touch them, and I'm not going to cook them. Okay. It's a little loaded. <laughs> let's let's talk about this. Let's see what you can try. Let's get some convenience, you know, convenience vegetables. Um, don't eat them at the table. Maybe you can eat them on the floor in the living room, like a picnic. Just get rid of that negative association. And if that's the case, know that you don't have to finish everything on your plate as an adult. So kind of really evaluating where you are before you jump into these changes. And this isn't the easy part. It's looking at your budget. It's looking at your time frame um, and your current lifestyle habits. 
Now, uh, another aspect that we had to learn uh, to become dietitians was the stages of change. Did anybody ever have to learn the stages of change? Okay, yeah, fun stuff. Um, it's really, really helpful. I thought it was so boring when I was going to school, and now I, now I totally can pinpoint with people and help them walk through this. Anyways, stages of change, we very rarely make change literally, in a linear, linear fashion. We, we start thinking about something. This has got to change. I've got to change my health. But I'm not ready to change my health. Or I don't even want to deal with that. I, I tried it before, and it didn't work. So then we come back to, i got to change my health. Well, sooner or later, we roll around to getting prepared. We start thinking, maybe we get a gym membership, and we go to the gym once or twice, or maybe we hire a personal trainer, or uh, maybe we go to the produce department for the first time, and we look at what's there. And we see the very fun people at Fred's. There's one guy, I don't know his name, but he's always in a good mood. And he can whittle, you know, when they cut off the celery, he's really fast at the produce. I really like him. And we start talking to him. And we say, okay, maybe produce isn't so bad. And then maybe we buy an apple. And we have it. And we see that it doesn't taste so bad. So then we start working towards action and maintenance. But if you're not ready to make a change, there's nothing that anybody can say to you or give you or help you or prepare for you because you're not ready to make a change. I mean, I wish I had gone through the stages of change before I moved up to Alaska. Like, maybe I would have stayed here two weeks during the winter and not just, you know, one day. <laughs> and maybe I would have come in the summers and thought, oh, we don't wear shorts and sandals up here. Um, or maybe I would have sold all of my cute little heels before I moved up here because we don't wear them. Um, but I just jumped right in. But we're doing okay. We're into maintenance. I kind of skipped the preparation part. Okay. Now to the changes. Now that we see why we need to make a change uh, and, and ways that um, maybe get in the way or make us different in kind of analyzing where we are, now we can make changes. So I, I tell you now that in order for good health to be a priority, nutrition has to be a priority. It just has to. Everything we eat, and I tell my students this all the time, everything we eat goes into our blood. It eventually gets into our blood. Everything. Every chemical, every nutrient, every preservative, every additive, it goes into your tummy, and if it doesn't go into your lymph system, it goes into your blood. Where does your blood go? Everywhere. Everything you eat goes everywhere. It doesn't just go through a hole. I mean, eventually some of it comes out, but it goes everywhere before it comes out. So, good nutrition has to be a priority. And right now, the changes that you make are an upfront deposit that pays off later in life. And I, I often hear, uh, well, I could get hit by a bus tomorrow. You could. Or you get hit by a bus in two years. So either way, those two years are still going to come if you get hit by a bus then. But maybe you don't get hit by a bus. I mean, what if you don't? Then you've wasted a lot of time wondering when you were going to get hit by a bus and not making any changes. So you might as well just make the changes and have a healthy life. And if you get hit by a bus, at least you died healthy. And then the people that are, you know, in the mortuary, they're like, wow, it's pretty good. It's a pretty good heart. Gets a little morbid. Okay, so we're going to learn what to eat, uh, how to eat, and when to eat. So what to eat. I'm sure you knew this was coming. You've got to eat plants, plant-based. Plants have vitamins, minerals, fiber, and phytochemicals. Phytochemicals are biological compounds only found in plants. They're not found in animals, they're found in plants. They have antioxidants that um, stop or repair free radical damage. Free radical damage, the crow's feet, the, and, oh, I thought the crow's feet were going to be bad. It's these lines right here. Thank goodness for plants, because I wonder how bad they would be if I didn't need them. Uh, so they help stop the aging and all the other free radical damage. Uh, phytochemicals also help to stop, they scavenge and can destroy carcinogens. So our body is always being attacked by carcinogens, whether we're breathing in the air, been here in the winter, yeah, okay, so whether we're breathing in the air or stuff that we eat, uh, phytochemicals help to stop that tumor formation. So there's about four steps, four of the, four of the six steps.
steps in tumor formation can be stopped by phytochemicals. So by plants, by eating that. Um, plants also help support health. They help to prevent chronic disease. What are we dying from? Chronic disease, which is related to our diet. So if we ate plants and had better health, then we would have decreased chronic disease and better life. And because plants are um, have more water and fiber in them, they help keep you full. And people that eat plant-based diets, on average, are lower in weight and leaner than people who eat um, a low plant diet. So I said plant-based. I didn't say vegetarian, and I did not say vegan. Though those are great um, uh, diets to adopt and, and lifestyles as far as plant-based all the time, but it's eating mostly plants. So you make plants the center of your meal, not meat. So you see the difference? So on, oh, I guess it would be the same for you guys. <laughs> on the left, it's just a big slab of meat and a little bit of vegetables. And on the right, we have a decently sized portion of meat and a lot of vegetables. Plant-based. Doesn't mean you have to go without meat. It just means having more plants. And plants. You don't have to have a garden, and you don't have to eat your house plants. Please don't. I think some of them are very poisonous. Um, but plants are fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, beans, legumes, whole grains. So the whole gamut, everything but animal. So animals are dairy and meat. The rest of it is plants. Well, you know, except for like the fake stuff like honey buns and candy bars. But everything else is plants. So oatmeal with berries and almonds. Peanut butter and jelly sandwich, plant-based. Um, bean soup with a little bit of chicken in there, plant-based. Trail mix, plant-based. You see how it's plants? And I love this quote from Michael Pollan. Eat food, mostly plants, not too much. Real food, not the fake stuff. Plant-based, and not more than what you need. Easy peasy. Now, how to eat. We want to enjoy we want to be prepared, and we want to be aware. We want to enjoy our food. And I, I, this is a difficult concept for us to grasp here in America. These um, pictures, I love the one. Ellery is the one with the, um, with the bib, the teeny tiny one. So her older sister, Ava, is helping her enjoy her meal by rubbing her head. Um, I think a Ava was really jealous when Ellery was born, so I'm not sure if she's trying to squish her head, but we're going to go with trying to love on her little sister. And this, these are my nieces, if I didn't say that before. And uh, Ellery is trying to allow her taste buds to adapt to a different flavor. So this was her given sweet potatoes for the first time. She doesn't have many of it. And I was there babysitting her, and of course, sweet potatoes were everywhere because she'd pull them out, and she did not like it. Give it another 10 or 20 times. She loves sweet potatoes. So plants, if you're not used to eating a plant-based diet, it doesn't taste the way that your other diet did. It takes time. you got to practice, and you have to practice and, en and enjoy your food. And uh, the salad here... Um, Fred's had edible flowers that they were selling with their herbs a couple years ago. They were beautiful, super expensive. I didn't care, though. I really wanted to make a salad and try them. And that meal was just gorgeous. I mean, it's so colorful there. Um, and it was a great salad. I think we had a little bit of salmon and some grilled potatoes. It was so colorful. Um, it really helped us to really enjoy that meal. I mean, and I took, I think I took a ton of pictures of this happen because um, it was really pretty. Being prepared. So you have to take time to prepare your food. And this is, and I tell you guys, I struggle with this. I really do. Meal planning um, for me is easy, but then I throw in my husband, and it's not so easy uh, because I'm planning for somebody else. Um, and even though he's married to a dietitian, and I shouldn't say this because he's not here, he doesn't always listen to me. I mean, he likes homemade macaroni and cheese and with poached eggs on top. Not kidding. And sometimes he'll get a frozen pizza and eat most of it with some Pringles on the side. But that's probably on a day that he worked really hard. So, anyways, that's set aside. You have to take time to prep. And I show these pictures. This is my refrigerator. Um, this is what it looked like on uh, Sunday. 
I made my oatmeal and then I made jars of veggies and bags of veggies for my husband. There's um, fruit jars for him and then I made rice and beans for myself. So we had breakfast and lunch taken care of, made all the convenience food. This looks wonderful on Sunday. It doesn't look so good the next Friday when it's all gone because then our refrigerator is completely empty. But it's a couple of hours that I do on the weekend so that I don't have to do any of this. You know, tonight I'll come home, I'll put his food in his lunchbox, my food in my lunchbox, done. That's, that's all you have to do to prep. So it's making your own convenience food. And if you're already chopping stuff up, you might as well just make it all for five days and call it good if that's your work week. And then I saw this picture on Pinterest. Um, somebody just made frozen crock pot meals. So they put all the ingredients in for a crock pot, you know, made... If you're already chopping up carrots, you might as well just chop them up for five days. So this is making your convenience food. It takes time. It takes time to learn. It takes a little time to prep. My kitchen is a disaster on Saturday or Sunday whenever I do this. But it's better being a disaster once and me cleaning up rather than being a disaster every night when I have to make food for the next day. And how to eat. Be aware. What is in your food? You know, we pay attention to so much other things that we that we buy or what's in this. Or um, I'm amazed at the natural compost and weed killer. And people are looking at what's in the weed killer that they're putting on their grass, but they don't look at what they're putting in their mouth. I mean, I think there are like, what, four days in the summer we can go sit on our grass? I mean, all, let's be honest. We have to mow it, and we don't ever get to enjoy it because it's so cold, at least it is for me. Anyways, but we care more about what we're putting on our soil, which is a good thing, than what we're putting in our bodies. So what is in your food, and why are you eating it now? I think it's really sweet that the bank puts out cookies. Are you hungry for them? Stale, boxed cookies. Why are you eating them? Just because they're there? The going away party that's at 1 o'clock, a potluck, and you had lunch at noon. Are you hungry again? Why are you eating? Can you just go there and just talk to people or a retirement party or a birthday party? I mean, pay attention to why we're eating. And then when to eat. Regularly and when you're hungry. There's a lot of debate whether six small meals or three meals and a snack. What works for you? If somebody told me that I could have six tiny little meals, I wouldn't be okay. I need to sit down and have a meal. I want to enjoy what I'm having and I feel like I've eaten rather than half eat and be hungry. But some people can't sit still for 20 minutes to eat a whole meal. So a small meal works for them. But it depends on what your calorie budget is and what your schedule is. When not to eat. We, don't, we shouldn't eat just because we're bored. We shouldn't eat just because it's there. And we shouldn't eat because it's offered to us. Just because it's offered to us. And I tell you as a wife, and I think I make pretty darn good food. When somebody doesn't want to eat my food, I kind of want to take offense. But I'm trying not to because I don't want to make somebody feel bad and take calories or food when they're not hungry. And particularly, I'm learning this with my husband, that he does not show his love based on all the food that he eats or doesn't eat. He eats until he's full and then he's done. And me, I need to just, that's fine. Because I don't want him to eat just because it's there or just because I offered it. So, um, and all of those shows on the food, I think there's a food channel. Um, it's just, we shouldn't eat just because we're watching it. I mean, get creative, that's awesome, but don't go into the kitchen when you're not hungry and try and make something just because you saw it on the TV show. So the outcomes, we've, we've talked about what a poor diet has, and improved outcomes really do, it, it lessens the obesity, the, the um, risk of heart disease, which, what's the number one killer in the United States? Heart disease. High blood pressure, cancer, it can also help to prevent cataracts, diabetes, diverticular disease, gallstones, and osteoporosis. And we find that this is not from the omission of meat, but rather the inclusion of fruits, vegetables, legumes, and whole grains. So it's not that you have to get rid of your meat. It's just you got to eat a little bit less. And again, plant-based. 
So new eating patterns can come about. We eat a little bit differently, and you have a, an improved discernment for fad diets. So someone says, well, you should go on that high-protein diet, no carbs. And you, because you're so smart, and I know you wouldn't do this anyways, but now that you really, really know the physiology behind it, you say, I didn't do a fad diet. I know better than that. So you, any diet that tells you that bacon is better than beans and lentils is not true. There isn't a population in this world that's surviving on bacon. And I'm, I'm not trying to be a bacon hater um, because I think it's really in vogue now. But um, come on. It's, it is a condiment and nothing more. It flavors food and nothing more. It's never better than beans. So keep calm and forget the fad diets. And one other thing before um, we come to a close, my, I had run this presentation by my boss, and she said, well, what are some ideas, you know, if people are just trying to improve things? Of course, this is my, my normal way that I eat, so I don't think of them as great ideas, but it helps people, I think, see things a little bit differently. So I eat fast food, but it's fast food that I make. Because when I come home and I'm hungry after work, I don't want to make anything. I want it to be quick. I want it to be convenient. And, I'm, and quite frankly, sometimes I'm lazy. So instead of getting burgers and fries and a sub sandwich and chips, you can have fast food if you keep fast food at home. You guys, they make sweet potatoes that they've already washed for you and put in some fancy doodle little plastic wrap that you put in the microwave. Perfect sweet potatoes. Perfect baked sweet potatoes every time. They're like a, a buck. I don't even know. Um, because I try not to, because I think they're a little bit more expensive than regular ones. So I, I try to justify. But you can bake a sweet potato and put black beans in a poached egg and you have a healthier huevos rancheros. Easy. Simple. Doesn't take very long. Um, salad greens with quinoa. You can buy frozen quinoa now that's already been cooked. It's nothing but quinoa. Heat that up in the microwave. Put it on your salad greens that come in a package that you don't have to rinse. And then cut up. You can make sure you rinse your beans, though, because that gets rid of the extra gas. So rinse your beans. Chop up some grapes, some roasted edamame. Boom. Perfect good salad. Tons of fruits and vegetables in there faster than it is to go through the drive-thru at McDonald's because for some reason that thing is always packed. Air pop popcorn and string cheese, sprinkle a little raisins in there. It's sweet, it's salty, it's, you know, with the cheese. And not even string cheese, you can even do it with Parmesan cheese. You're not going to use a ton of Parmesan cheese and it flavors it. Um, if you use Parmesan cheese, you don't even have to use salt. So these are all ways to have fast food that's healthier than anything that you can buy um, at a fast food joint. So nutrition really does matter. So if you start small and you change one thing, improve one habit, you start making over your habits and making over your health. So one thing that you can do starting tomorrow, well, I don't know about you guys, I'm kind of a Monday starter or a, a specific day. So it's not the first, and it's not the 20th, and it's not a Monday. So you can hang on to your one habit to change until Monday if you want to. Or you could go rogue and change tomorrow, because that would be a Wednesday, and it would be the 23rd. So that wouldn't fit any of those. I digress. Anyways, so you could eliminate liquid sugar. You could take a walk after dinner. You could buy a cookbook and try new recipes. Um, you could take the stairs. You could plan one meal per week. So these are all tiny little things that you can do to make over your habits. Thank you. Any, oh, any questions? <laughs> oh, and I think at 8 o'clock, I was supposed to say something. Well, just to, if people have other events they need to get to, feel free. I, Tiffany might take it umbrage at it, but probably not. <laughs> and then, um, but then we'll open it up for questions. Yes, so if you have to go, you can, but if you have questions. Did you have a question? Yes. Um, what do you think about uh, something to snack at night before you go, go to bed? Another three meals a day and... Uh, and then so you're saying six meals a day as long as you keep it small and, and, and any time work. You know, I think it um, 
If you're active throughout the day and you had a really small dinner and you're still hungry, it's better to have a snack before you go to bed than it is to get up in the middle of the night when you've already been sleeping. So um, when, um, when I eat in the wintertime, I eat earlier and then I teach and then I do have a snack before I go to bed because otherwise I'll be up at 2 in the morning. So as long as it fits within your calorie budget, generally it's okay. Does eating healthier like this, does the food move through your body faster? So she said, does, is eating healthier, does your food move through your body faster? Yes and no. No, because there's generally more fiber, so it takes longer for your body to break it down. So if you can think about the difference between digesting a saltine cracker and a celery stick. It's going to take a lot longer for you to break down a celery stick than it would be a saltine cracker. However, your body doesn't have to, um, and this is for lack of a better physiological term, doesn't have to freak out with the preservatives, you know, and get inflamed, you know, that low-line inflammation when it has a lot of preservatives and chemicals. It doesn't know what to do with them. It doesn't, it's not a normal thing that goes through the body. So in an essence, plant-based food that is whole, your body knows what to do with. It already knows where to put it away, but that other stuff, it, it's like, I don't know where this goes. I don't know what I should do with this. I don't know if I should get rid of it. You know, it alters its metabolic. So that's the dietitian answer to that question. Yes and no. <laughs> yes? Would you say something about oils for salad dressing? And for frying some meat or... So oils to have for salad dressing, better or, oils? I mean, what would you use? Would you use, uh, I use olive oil for that. Right. So for salad dressing, um, olive oil has a lower smoke point, meaning that it gets hotter at a, it starts to smoke at a lower temperature than something like canola oil. So if you were going to fry, like quick saute or stir fry, you'd want to use canola oil because you could get it hotter, which would make a crispier vegetable. But if you wanted flavor, olive oil and good olive oil has better flavor than canola oil, and so does sesame oil. But all oils, regardless of their smoke point, are 120 calories per tablespoon. So they all have the same amount of calories. Is virgin olive oil or extra virgin olive oil better than just plain old olive oil? I think the taste is better. The, what? the taste. It it seems like it tastes fresher. And if you can and if you ever have the opportunity to smell the different oils, the ones that smell more olivey are going to are um are a better oil, but chances are they're more expensive. So you wouldn't say that extra virgin olive oil is necessarily better than no. regular? No, I wouldn't say it's better. They all have very many different uses. So for flavor, I really, on a salad, I love, my new kick is sesame oil. It's very pungent. Um, pungent's probably not the right word. It's uh, very flavorful, and, and it smells good, um, but it's very expensive. So I wouldn't be frying with it at all. And it has a lower smoke point, too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So salmon, um, he said, we do have a lot of salmon in here. And, and how much, I mean, we, I saw one of my girlfriends, she's a dietitian down in Saldana, she caught 92 salmon in one day. First of all, when is she working? I don't know. Anyways, that's another point. Um, salmon is really good, and but just because it's good for you doesn't mean you need a ton of it. So three to four ounces at a you know, for one meal is a good amount. So if you had, if you made, if, if that was your meat for every meal, then three to four ounces would be fine. I mean, if you had, you know, salmon, um, with toast for breakfast and a salmon salad for lunch and then cooked salmon for dinner. That'd be fine to have it all day long, but just 
only three to four ounces per time. Okay, per time. Mm -hmm. Then be like a ounce a day. Yes. I mean, if you want, if you had that much salmon, and if you have too much, I'll take some. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. Any other questions? Oh yes. Like the, this is potato, it seems compared with the bread. You know, is potato is very bad, just the like carbs or you know, farming? Well, first of all, potatoes are really good. They're a higher source of potassium than a banana, so they're an excellent food to have. And we have a, we have a lot of good potatoes up here. They are complex carbohydrates. So potatoes, particularly with the skin, um, has a lot of fiber in it, and the skin holds on to a lot of minerals because they're grown under the ground, so they get some of the minerals from the soil. Then potatoes themselves have a lot of potassium inherently. When it comes to bread, um, first of all, you want to get the one without azodicarbonamide, that additive, and it is a carbohydrate. Bread is higher in calories per slice than you know, you could have a, almost a cup of potatoes for about the same amount of calories you could have for some slices of bread, like the bigger slices of bread that are 120, 130 calories per slice. So depending on how many calories you're burning, if you need a lot of calories during the day, you know, bread is, would fit in there. But if you are only on an 1800 calorie diet and two slices of bread or 240 calories, you know, that's a big part of your meal. So it, it's not that bread is bad, and if you have bread, most of your bread should be whole grain. So the really thick, um, dark, heavy, whole wheat bread. Um, it's not bad, it's just processed over. So instead of bread, you know, um, Maybe you would have a potato instead. Does that make sense? So it's not, it's not the, it's not bad. It's just not a best choice. Yes. What would you say would make a good meal? About a quarter of a pound of meat, or a half a pound, or a um, day? about a quarter of a pound of meat. So what would make a good meal? Yes. So that's about four ounces. It's about um, about four ounces. Yeah. So that's, I mean, when we look at quarter pounders, isn't that what a regular cheeseburger is? Is that a quarter pounder or a third? That's right. Okay. So it's, it's not a lot of meat, but we don't need a lot of meat. If you need, um, I, I try to do this example. Carbohydrates are a grenade. You have to have a ton of carbohydrates. And protein is a sniper missile. It's a sniper. You only need a little bit because it's very specific. Protein will not do its job if you don't have enough carbohydrates. So we think about what protein does. Um, it helps maintain our skin integrity. It helps maintain our immunity, our hair, our nails, um, our making hormones, all of that. Protein is very particular. But when you don't give enough carbohydrates, Protein then has to provide energy, and protein can be turned into glucose, whereas fat cannot. So we don't need a ton of protein. We need way more carbohydrates than we need protein. To think that we could get rid of carbs is about, in part of my language, the most asinine thought. I mean, your body just needs them. You have to have them. And any time that you cut out carbohydrates and you put them back into your body, your liver contains about five pounds of glycogen, which is stored carbohydrates, so that when you're sleeping, your body can make glucose for your brain because even though you shut down, your brain never does, so it always needs carbohydrates. When you get rid of carbohydrates and your body has to work really hard to break down protein, which comes in the form of your muscle, your GI tract, tons of your cells, uh, your hair, your skin, uh, to make glucose, and, and it, because after it's depleted everything from your liver. So when you go off carbs and then you start eating carbs again, you gain about five to seven pounds, which is the glycogen that's needed back into your liver. 
And to, to take that away, I mean, your liver is going to hate you for a long time. Like, you'll see those people on those high-protein diets, their skin just starts to slough off. Like, it, I mean, it doesn't really slough off, I promise. Like, don't go pulling on somebody's skin. Are you on a diet? Or is that just flabby skin? Um, they become really gray and sulking in, and you see this look, and they lose their muscle tone. They start to, and after a while, they just look just depleted because you need protein um, to do those very specific jobs, and it won't do it with, when there isn't enough carbohydrates. And the same thing with fat. For those, any science buffs in here? Okay, so fat is a bunch of stored hydrogen molecules. They, that will go aflame with oxygen. Well, guess what holds oxygen? Carbohydrates, CHO, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. You will not burn fat if you don't have carbs. Carbs are the fire, it's the flame that lights the fat fire. So you have to have carbs. So people that get rid of carbs, they're using their protein to fuel their brain, not to maintain their muscle, and they're using the fat for a little bit of energy, but not without a lot of stress on the body, because it needs carbohydrates to instantly start it. If you've ever had a fire, like your whole fireplace is full of dry wood, but no match, you don't have a fire. So that's why you have to have carbs. That's why I say it's asinine to, to get rid of them. Plus, they're the cheapest food source. Have you seen dried beans? Like a buck thirty-nine for a pound. That's eleven cups. I counted one time. No, I'm sorry. Eleven servings. So eleven half cups. So what is that? Five and a half. See, I can't do math. I have to have my little calculator. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Do you have any comments on the hours at which people eat? For example, uh, I like supper around 6 o'clock, but I lived for a while in Europe, and the French would start eating around 7 or 7.30, and Spain, about 9.30 is when they're thinking about dinner and everything. And, and, uh, do you have any comments on the distribution of time throughout the day? It's, it's interesting, um, in doing some of this research and looking at the differences, Americans tend to, and one recommendation I make is to have a big breakfast, smaller lunch, and a smaller dinner. Well, when are Americans really active? Morning. I mean, you're seen as sleeping in if you sleep in until 9 in the morning. Like, we're up at 6 or 7, and we go to bed fairly early. But in Spain, I mean... They party all the time. Like, they're up till 2 o'clock in the morning. So eating dinner at 9 makes sense because they're not going to get up until 10 o'clock in the morning. And so they, they have their bigger meal when they're most active when it's cooler in the evening. Whereas here, we're more active in the daytime and we kind of peter off at night. So I think it really has to do with your activity. And I think it's smarter to eat to give yourself a little bit of time to digest before you go to bed so that you don't have a tummy ache. Any other questions? Yes. Do you have any comments about the use of the squid and the fish egg? Fish eggs. Um, the Japanese eat this one. Is that good or bad? Well, I think the Japanese are doing way better than Americans are as far as health, so it must be good. I, um, I don't know much about that, though um, it would be a good source of fat and probably good oils because they're the eggs. So um, our eggs are almost like a little multivitamin, and this is not to be disgusting, but it's a whole animal in one. You know, just like a whole baby that you eat at one time. So you get a lot of nutrients if you eat the yolk. So I would assume that you'd be getting a lot of nutrients from the fish eggs, but I, I don't know, and I've never tried it. Have you tried it? Is it good? <laughs> I just didn't know yet. I tried it. It must have a high cholesterol. <laughs> you know, but it's not cholesterol that... Imp increases our cholesterol. It's saturated fat in the amount of exercise that we do. So we never have to eat cholesterol. Our body makes it on its own. So they do have a lot of cholesterol, but what we're finding out is 
that doesn't mean very much in the whole scope of things. If you have a couple of eggs or fish eggs a day, but you have a plant-based diet, you're healthier than having a low cholesterol diet that is null, that doesn't have a lot of plants in it, that would be higher in saturated fat and trans fat, because that's what freaks out the body and causes high cholesterol and genetics more so than dietary cholesterol. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know where she puts the battery. Yeah, it's kind of in there. <laughs> it's kind of goofy. They don't have a way of turning it off without the battery. The battery. <laughs> they really don't want you to turn that on. No, they don't. Nice job. Oh, I, thank you. You didn't um, talk about uh, how you prepare the vegetables. Is that an issue? You know, um, I. <sighs> it can be. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. And and I think so. It can be an issue. Um, but what we see is that no matter how people prepare the vegetables, populations that eat more vegetables are healthier. Okay. So whether that, in the theory of raw and enzymes, just discredits how great our bodies are at digesting. So, um, I mean, clearly you don't want to really overcook them because then they wouldn't taste that good. Right. Um, and they would leach. But even if you overcook them, it'd still be better than not having them at all. Right. So, and cooking brings out a little bit of flavor. Um, well, I was thinking of the crock pot thing. Mm -hmm. I often think crock pots just cook them too much because you're it's cooking all day and you right. come home. And, but if you eat the the water, or the broth, or whatever that's mm -hmm. in there, then whatever's leached out into the water, you're eating. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Good. And it lends to flavor, and the flavor is the phytochemical. Do you have a yes. jump Whoops. Yep, and I think I said to let it out. Okay. Let me just. Uh... Quick question. Mm -hmm. I was looking at a Mountain Dew today. It's got like 47 grams of sugar. Uh -huh. That's huge. Isn't it? Yes. Not to mention the bromated vegetables. Yes. That's really. Yeah. I'm yeah. cutting off. Good. Yeah. <laughs> um, my husband. Now, are you a soda drinker? Just Mountain Dew. Just Mountain Dew. My husband was on Mountain Dew, and um, I brought. Um, I'm gonna have this when I head home. It's. Largely the carbonation yeah. that you're you're attracted to, not necessarily the Mountain Dew. Yeah. So we started on these for him to get off Mountain Dew. I mean, yeah, and have you, the Lacroix is really good, but it's the super expensive stuff at really? Fred's. It? But it's um, and you'll see I'm like so it's got the carbonated water, okay. which is um, which is the addicting part, okay. and just lemon and lime. But it's this. Fred Meyer sparkling seltzer water. Okay. You can try this one if you want. Oh, that's okay. I'll buy. I'll buy one. That, thank you. Mhm. Mm I. Uh, and what did you say the one was expensive? Just what was that? The Lacroix. L A. You've seen, probably I've seen, seen that. Yeah. Yeah. It's like five eighty nine. I always. A six pack. Oh, no, for a twelve pack. So it's okay. not that okay. bad, but like this stuff is three something, and yeah. so. But they've got grapefruit and orange. It's really good. Yeah. You might like it. So, <laughs> I, I had gum surgery and I, I couldn't brush this side, so I just without thinking much about it, I quit drinking not for like a week and a half. Nice. Two weeks. Good for and you. I, and I, there, there's a bunch of them in my refrigerator. I haven't touched them yet. So I you could them. always give them to the food bank. Yeah, I think I will. Because I know <laughs> that stuff's terrible. And I, I think all that sugar helps uh, towards getting dementia. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It does. The liquid sugar, our bodies just don't know what to do with. Yeah. So good for you. We'll keep well, up the good work. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Mm-hmm. I've got to ask this question because my questions are sometimes uh, complicated. I just got back from a 19th trip to Peru. I average about five months a trip. Wow. Uh, when I'm here, I, in September to December, I exercise three times a week. There I do not exercise. Here I eat two meals a day. There I eat three meals a day in restaurants. Mm -hmm. uh, the weight falls away there. I know if I come home, I'm going to fatten up and dumb down. Um, and uh, it's just been very, and since I traveled so much and for so long time, I realized that um, food's just bad for me. It's not. It's whatever. However, a lot of the a lot of the uh, foods here are corn-based, subsidized corn, whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's um, 
on Sancho Corn and that it, uh, um, it's a registered herbicide. Mm -hmm. So that it, if a bug eats it, it'll, it'll kill them. Right. And I'm kind of wondering how much of the problem that I have with uh, food in the United States is um, because my gut flora does not like what I'm eating here. And I notice serious changes in my constitution. It's not the uh, Montezuma's revenge against you, it's the George Washington two step. <laughs> and uh, and I, uh, um, my gut is never, never good here until I go back to Peru or wherever. Italy. Right. So, one thing that I would really wonder about the weight is why don't you eat as frequently here? Why don't I eat what? As frequently. Well, uh, I'm just, I'm thinking that I would gain more weight, and, and I do. Well, but when you only eat two meals a day, you slow things down. And so your body becomes very efficient at storing fat because it's not getting food as frequently. So if I eat more here, I might lose weight? You, if you ate more frequently, yeah. I, w I would think that would be one thing. And then the other thing is, what are what are you eating here that's different? Of course you say that. It's all, is it fresh? I, 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 eat, I eat yogurt, I, try to eat, I, I don't eat that many meats. Do you eat yogurt that's sweetened or plain? I eat uh, Nancy's yogurt because I think it's real yogurt. Okay, but it's not sweetened? It's not sweetened. One thing I would want, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt about the, the ingredients in the food. I mean, that wouldn't surprise me at all. I mean, we ate more when we were over in Europe, and um, and this, yeah. I mean, and I think we were also walking around a lot more. But that's what people think it is. It's, it's not. I used to be in this club. It's, it's, uh, I think we should do a nice, nice type of analysis on that. Oh yeah, it wouldn't surprise me at all. But I'm. I would wonder. The one thing would Thanks. be the. Thank you very much. It was nice meeting you. Yeah, um, you can walk out if you oh gosh, I need this. Um, I wonder if it's if it's with the frequency. When you're eating more, you're. It's it's like with money. Whenever you have to budget, you hold tightly to everything. But when money's free flowing in, you just kind of spend it. However, and the same thing to a certain degree with calories. If your body's eating regular meals and not fasting in between times. Um, because you're not doing it for years on end, you know, it's only a couple months and you go back to a different eating habit, it gets really efficient at storing so that it can have energy for later. Um, in the past, I ate three meals here, and I just couldn't do it. Uh, it just, I just blew it out. Interesting. And, well, and so then if that's the case, what happens if you didn't eat any processed foods? Um, no? Then I probably have starved that. <laughs> You know, what if it was only local or some way that 